So welcome, welcome and good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Mark Weber, I'm the chair of the Cut Train Collaboration Board. It's my pleasure to guide you through this uh, morning today. Today is a very special day for many people, for all of us in this room. And many of us have worked for more than a decade, much more than a decade for this, for this particular moment. They've put all their energy, creativity, and I should say also their patience into this, into this particular project. And it's very rewarding that uh, in our very first uh, physics run, we already uh, uh, achieve quite, quite uh, excellent results. I should, I should add that weighing elementary particles is not, is not easy. They are, to the best of our knowledge, infinitesimally small and measuring the the mass um, of a particle so elusive as the neutrino, which, for example, has no electric charge and, uh, and many other exciting and unusual properties is extremely challenging. And uh, so we'll hear about this. We'll hear how far we got there, how we got there in this uh, series of, uh, of brief talks. And we will now, without further ado, Jump into into the the uh, the core of this uh, of this uh, lecture series. Now, let me mention that uh, we will have only the the absolute minimum of urgent questions directly um, after the talks, because there is the press conference at eleven uh, forty-five for extensive discussion. Um, but if there is some some extremely urgent which has to be clarified, then please give me give me a sign. And now we move on with the first um, speaker, which is Professor Christian Weinheimer from the University of uh, Münster, co spokesperson of the Katrin experiment, and he will tell us, in my words, why it is so extremely important to know about the mass of the neutrino.
Yes, thank you very much, Mark, for this introducing our session about the Catron results for which we have been working and for 18 years. And it's really a great pleasure to see so many faces who have uh, gone this way over the 18 years with all of us, or we have taken part of this way and made very important contributions. My task is to let you wait. I, you have just heard 18 years. So you have to wait also more than one and a half hour to get the result. Don't expect that from me. I would like to give you motivation why neutrino masses are so important for cosmology and particle physics. And by the way, how I get this PDF away, does somebody know? I can't. Hmm? I will live with that. I would like to report. Yeah. Big Okay, I go closer to the microphone, yeah. Um, I would like to report about the neutrinos because some of you are not so familiar with it. I will show you why it's important to measure the mass because we have evidences that these elusive particles have masses. I will talk about the importance of these masses for particle and cosmology and show you three complementary ways to the neutrino mass and then I will give you the key methods to make the next generation of experiments, the Catherine experiment with 200 millivolt sensitivity to cover the full quasi degenerate neutrino mass regime. Neutrinos are fundamental particles. You see here on, sorry, you see here the three particles which make up our matter, the electrons, and the up and down quarks to make the nucleus of an atom. And to that, there is an electron neutrino being the partner of the electron. And we see three copies of these matter particles at higher masses. That is our normal matter. In the standard model, these nine particles, not the neutrinos, get their mass by the particle, which is sometimes called the cot particle, the Higgs, which has been discovered some years ago at CERN by a vertex, which you see here. Neutrinos are very different. In contrast to the other particles, they are neutral. They have spin one half like the others. They only interact weakly, and they have interaction lengths which are larger than the diameter of the sun and the earth, much, much larger light years and they are the most abundant particles together with a photon in the universe. We count 336 neutrinos per cubic centimeters. And in the original standard model of particle physics, our model, how we understand the world, we have only so-called left-handed neutrinos, and therefore it's difficult to account for them a mass term like for the other particle, it doesn't exist. So we have to be more creative to create a mass term for the neutrinos. And that's why the neutrinos were massless in the standard model. Why massless? Because they experimentally, they have masses, if at all, which are much, much, much lower than that of all other particles. You see here the three generation of particles, the down and up quark making the neutron and proton of the nucleus of an atom and the electron to make the the shell of the atom. And you see that the corresponding electron neutrino is many, many orders lower in mass at most. You see the second and the third generation, they all lie rather well on this logarithmic scale at the same mass, and the neutrinos are at least a million times lighter. Why they are so much lighter? Neutrinos were thought up to the end of last century to be massless. And if they still have tiny masses, this extreme tininess of their masses should require a completely different mass generation process, just not just the so-called Yukawa coupling to the Higgs. And that makes neutrino masses so interesting for particle physics. But it was not expected to be such an interesting stuff up to end of last century, when in two famous experiments, 
the effect of neutrino oscillation has been discovered. That muon neutrino being produced accompanied with a muon in atmospheric neutrinos convert into a tau neutrino in flight and solar electron neutrinos convert into muon and tau neutrinos in flight. And here they are the data of these two famous experiments, Subak Kamiokande, where you see here a clear deficit in terms of cosine theta. And here is the result of the solar neutrinos as seen in snow. And these are the two gentlemen who got recently the Nobel Prize, uh, Takaaki Kajida for the Super Kamiokande collaboration and Art McDonald for the snow collaboration, having discovered that neutrinos in flight convert into another species. And they do that because they are superposition, like in a double slit experiment of neutrino mass eigenstate, which propagate in vacuum and in matter. That tells us that neutrinos have differences of squared masses. And that means that neutrino masses have to be non-zero, but the absolute scale of the neutrino masses is not known. It cannot be measured by these kind of oscillation experiments. And that is in contrast to that neutrino masses are so important. With oscillation physics, we can now measure delta m squared. So that is really annoying that we have that. Does somebody know how to get rid of that? Let me just to get that away, but it still appears. Okay, delta m squared and the three mixing angles that we can measure, we can therefore describe that a mass neutrino eigenstate one consists mainly of electron neutrino, a little bit muon and tau neutrino, whereas the mass two and three states are another combination of that. But if we are after the neutrino masses, we can do the following. Since we don't know the masses themselves, but the differences of squared mass states, we can assume that we would know the smallest of the neutrino masses and then plot with knowing these two delta m square from experiments, we can reconstruct the whole neutrino mass scenario as function of the smallest mass. And that is for normal ordering and that is so, for so-called inverse ordering. What you see here is that for small, smallest neutrino mass, we have a rather hierarchical scenario of neutrino masses where we have the so-called seesaw mechanism type one, which dates back to the famous Nobel laureate Stephen Weinberg, which could explain the smallest of the masses, but not the large mixing of neutrinos. But it could also happen that we are in this regime where the neutrino masses are almost all the same. We call that the quasi-degenerate regime and that these neutrinos are more or less all the same and we have another mechanism to explain that. So knowing wh whether we are here or here is very important to understand the mechanism which explains the neutrino masses. Why is that important? That is so important because these mechanisms gives us a handle to very high scales in physics, much beyond what we can reach with Earth-bound uh, collider experiments at CERN and other places. And the second reason why that is so important, we have said 336 neutrinos per cubic centimeter. If we put that in here, then we can read on that scale, what is the contribution to the mass and energy content of our universe? All is one, two, Third, a bit more is so-called dark energy. A little bit more than a quarter is cold dark matter. That are all the baryons, that means all the atoms. And the neutrino masses could all lie around here, maybe as much as all the stars <coughs> in the whole universe or all the atoms in the universe. And that's why neutrino masses are also very important for cosmology. There are threefold ways complementary to search for the absolute scale. It's for the first cosmology, which measures from signals like the cosmic microwave background, which exhibits our universe at the age of 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We can map out the distribution of matter by scanning the galaxies and look for the power of structure 
in the universe at different scales. And we com can compare that with large computer simulations which calculate how the structure should look like if we include neutrino masses of various size, having in, taken into account the 336. And applying all that to the so-called lambda called dark matter model gives us limits on the neutrino mass of around 120 milli electron volt. But this neutrino mass limit is model dependent because neither dark energy is understood, neither dark matter is discovered. That means 95% of the energy and matter density of the universe is still not known. And, but the whole model describes that well and gives this limit. There's a search for neutrino loss double beta decay, which you also can do in the lab, but you require that uh, the barrier number, uh, uh, sorry, the lepton number is violated, and that you are only sensitive to my runner neutrinos, and therefore model dependence comes in as well. And finally, there is the direct neutrino mass determination where no faster assumptions are needed. You just use the elect, um, energy momentum relationship from special relativity, and that's why m square is the observable. And that is really model independent. You can, in some cases, every part of a century, you can do a time of flight measurement if you catch neutrinos from a supernova, or you can do in the lab the investigation of kinematics of weak decays, like beta decays of tritium, or what is here lost is electron capture of honium and you measure the charge decay products. And that is the way we go with Katrin, the beta electron spectrum, which is coming out of a tritium beta decay together with the electron antineutrino. Its, its energy spectrum, which is shown here, is governed by a phase space just of the decay, so there are no rather uncertainties there. It's very easy to measure that in principle but you have to be extremely precise because only the very upper end of the beta spectrum expanded here shows you whether the spectrum rises quadratically for mass zero or deviates a little bit and ends a little bit earlier for non-zero mass. And just to give you a scale of one electron volt, that fraction of difference is two times 10 to the minus 13 of all beta decays. Please have that number in mind and See, it's a small number. You require an isotope with a low endpoint, and that's why you use tritium or holmium, and you need a very high energy resolution, very high luminosity, and very low background, and that's why you use in tritium MACE filters or cryobolometers for holmium. And I'm very happy that Christian Enz uh, from the ECHO experiment, who goes the other way, is here with us. So. So the, the stage is set. You want to measure the neutrino mass because there are no other means to really model independently get that. That is called a direct mass. And that is what physicists have done over the last 70 years. And what you see here is a Moore plot of the mass limit in milli electron volt over the past six or seven decays. And you see that these experiments always improve with time. And I have marked two important milestones to go down here, and the first one is the invention of the gaseous molecular tritium source at Los Alamos to lower systematics, and the second is the invention of the so-called MACE filter spectrometer at Mainz and Reutz. At the end of all these measurements, there was a neutrino mass sensitivity and limit of two electron volt. We all want to go down at least to the quasi-degenerate mass scale, and there is about an order of magnitude to go. Let me just tell you about the milestone for the next generation of experiments at windowless gaseous tritium source being invented at Los Alamos. The main idea you have streaming in in a chain of superconducting solenoids. In the middle, you, st uh, you stream in tritium gas, which gets returned on both sides, and the beta electrons are guided by a magnetic field towards a spectrometer, which is a magnetic uh, spectrometer of uh, orange type, uh, multiple orange type spectrometer. And that allows you to measure that tritium spectrum without large systematic uncertainties. 
And then there came the invention of the so-called MacE filter. Here you see pictures of the Mainz experiment and of the Troyes experiment. I, and I want to give you also names here. Hamish Robertson was the leader of the Los Alamos experiment and Otten and Jochen Bonn of the Mainz experiment and Vladimir Lobashov of the Troyes experiment. And the latter two have invented uh, that MacE filter technology, which allows to very sharply investigate the beta spectrum by an integrating spectrometer of which the transmission function is a step-like function with very sharp energy resolution. And that allows you to measure the spect uh, beta spectrum with high resolution and large acceptance, so giving huge statistics. Now you have two things together. Low systematics by the windowless gaseous freedom source and huge systematic statistics <coughs> by the MACE filter technology. But if you look to these pictures, that is not what you will see later at the tour. Catherine is a completely different experiment from a different even decade or century. It's much more high tech, much more big. But these technologies let the stage and open the vision that we could go for an experiment which has a two milli electron volt sensitivity, which requires a factor 100 improvement of statistical and systematic uncertainties. And that is a huge challenge. Putting all together what I said, and with a lot of new ideas and technologies, that was the idea of the Cartier Tritium Neutrino experiment. It's technology extremely challenging. It requires a huge amount of tritium throughput and that's why the international collaboration who founded that experiment uh, 18 years ago considered the best plate place in Europe, at least, maybe in the world, for such an undertaking is Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And it's not only the best place for it, it's a place where you can make that factor 100 improvement statistically and systematic uncertainty because that T stands for technology and that is extremely important. Before I close at this point, I would like to, to remember three founding members and pioneers of the Katrin experiment who passed away on the long road of the last 18 years of Katrin. That's Jochen Bonn from the Mainz experiment, that is Vladimir Lobashov, the head of the Troyes experiment, and very recently, unfortunately, that's Ernst Otten the head of the Mainz experiment and who followed Katrin over all the 18 years up to now. My last transparency is because I talk, talk about physics is beyond the neutrino mass. With that precision measurement which Katrin allows of the tritium beta spectrum, we can look for other very important things <laughs> of beyond the standard model physics. We can look for sterile neutrinos, which gives us an additional beta kink of a different neutrino mass. We can do that either in the electron volt, uh, for electron volt neutrinos where there are indications, or for the KV uh, sterile neutrinos where we even uh, really plan an upgrade with the Tristan detector. And there are other additions of the standard model like non-standard model currents or additional light bosons, which could be warm dark matter, which we can look at with an unprecedented precedented precision. And that is what all makes the Katrin physics case as a very strong and interesting question. Thank you very much. And I would... Well, many thanks to Christian. I do not see those very urgent questions. So we move on to the next talk. The next talk will be given by um, Professor Guido Drexlin from KIT and uh, also co spokesperson together with uh, Christian, the Catron experiment. And uh, Christian already hinted at the importance of technology. And uh, Guido will explore this a little more and, and uh, tell us why Catherine has to be cathedral of technology to function. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Also from my side, a very warm welcome. Isn't this a great time to be here? I think uh, 
we have presented this first result, which you can really now access on the archive here or come later to us. Um, it's a great time after 18 years of build-up of this experiment. And so I think it's also time that we have this colloquium here, right at the place where Katrin is operating, where so many people have contributed to make this a reality. It was a pleasure to see many people who have contributed to that earlier during their PhDs, master thesis. And so this colloquium is really to say thank you to all of you, to those people who made it possible um, to, um, whoops, yeah, by giving us money, by supporting us. Uh, I think, Reinhard, you are here as part of the people who have contributed so much to that. Uh, I think it's very important to have support by many, many people. And this is just to say thank you to all of you. So my task is really now, um, yeah, um, to give you an overview that what we have achieved over the past 18 years is a real bona fide high-tech uh, instrument. And this 20 minutes that I've been allotted is really insufficient really to tell you about everything of this experiment, which works much better than uh, I think this projector here. So basically, um, Katrin is a high-tech instrument, and the question that we are, uh, I think, uh, following is what Christian has said, what are the masses of the three known neutrinos, and possibly there is more in the uh, framework of sterile neutrinos. Now, what we have built over the past 18 years is this very long instrument about a kilometer from us away, which really is designed to be the ultimate way to measure neutrino masses with a windowless gaseous tritium source in combination here with this very huge MACE filter that Christian has just uh, reported about. And I think the important thing is if you would like to measure what is the imprint of neutrinos in cosmology, what is the imprint in particle physics, you really need to focus on technology, on enabling technologies. And uh, I think over the past 18 years, we have uh, developed quite a few of cutting edge technologies which you can see in operation later and uh, the nice thing is even after 18 years we still continue to make this experiment even better we have not yet finished it and i think we will never finish um, to make it better so uh, we still have great goals uh, to reduce background to make katrin uh, more sensitive to all these nice effects that may be revealed by neutrinos by showing us beyond the standard model physics let me again remind you here, most of you work on Katrin here, what beautiful instrument we have working here and what its main ingredients are. So in basically, um, we have a windowless gaseous tritium source that is combined here with this very huge, largest, I think, ever MACE filter, I think, at least for the foreseeable future. And we combine it here so that the electrons are being generated here in the source. And that's a huge number, 10 to the 11 electrons per second and they are guided adiabatically by this very strong magnetic fields from superconducting solenoids here to this filter. And this is the most precise filter for electrons ever built. So only the very high energy electrons are passing here through this MACE filter and are re-accelerated here and then finally counted as a function here of the retarding energy. And this is what we call then an integral spectrum of electrons. And you see later than the talks that will give you details about how we analyze it. I focus on those technologies here that are very important. If you have this huge source with this very large uh, spectrometer in between, you need a pumping stage, a differential, and a cryogenic pumping section. And you also need very good detectors, really, to tell you what is happening in this 70-meter-long beam line. Now, what we have is a huge luminosity, and I always compare Katrin with all due respects to our colleagues here, that the LHC, um, that the particle density of order of 10 to the 11 may approach that. It's not, of course, this nice other things that you produce there. It's just electrons and ions. But I think even that to control is quite difficult. I will not talk about plasma effects, but I think one of the nice things that we are pioneering is how is a very strong plasma behaving? And uh, what we are doing, as I told you, we have here the electrons that are being guided. But by the way, we also need really to reduce the number of, um, oops, I think something is really happening here. Um, we also, maybe, Michael, we can work on that. There seems to be some sort of, maybe we can use another slide. OK. 
Can you use it? Mm. Okay. Micah, you have magic hands. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Marcos. Yeah, maybe you come up and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's an applause for Marcos. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we were here at the stage where we have a huge number density of particles. And at the very end here, the focal plane detector, you would like to have here a very low number, a background of uh, something like 0.1 counts per second. So you need really to control this high intensity area with this low intensity area, and I'd always like to compare it to a low background experiment because we need, I think, to understand radioactive substances in our spectrometer very well. And I think this is one of the challenges that we are facing as a collaboration, how to combine the 10 to the 11 decadel uh, with a 0.1 counts per second at the rear end. Uh -huh. I seem to be doing something not perfectly, but let's try again. Um, and really to guide the electrons from the source, you, as I told you, you need very detailed, very strong superconducting solenoids. Uh, you need to reduce the magnetic field by several orders of magnitude so that the magnetic gradient collimates then the pitch angles of the electrons so that in here this retarding potential can really filter those things. And we have developed here this so-called uh, Cassiopeia code. And you see it's already difficult to assess whether this here is the origin, our spectrometer, and this is then the virtual reality in our Cassiopeia code. So we have a very good understanding on how to track particles, and this is one of the successes of our experiment, that we do have a very good understanding of those things. And when preparing this talk, I thought, uh, what can I tell you? And this is uh, not to overwhelm you, but this is everything we have to think about, really to measure the neutrino mass, and you see you need to have technologies on tritium handling, ion systematics, panning traps. You need to operate that at ultra-high vacuum. You need to adiabatically guide those electrons and make sure that this works. You have to understand optics in the VUV range, plasma physics, laser spectroscopy. You need to develop electron sources, rarefied gas flow, and cryosorption, low-level technologies, and high-voltage precision. So it's really a huge number of different uh, technologies. Let me, as I said, give you a few of them more detailed. And um, the first one why we are here is because we have an expertise now of about three decades in Tritsum technologies. This is why we're here, because KIT hosts the Tritsum Laboratory Karlsruhe, which is absolutely essential really to operate our source. And I'd like to remind you, if you would like to operate a source with 10 to the 11 better decays um, at, at a, a, a column density of 5 times 10 to the 17 molecules, you need an entire laboratory, you need a research infrastructure. And in our case, this is 30 plus scientists, engineers, technicians, PhD students, and uh, master students, and many others, um, really to make sure that we can really operate this at a high purity of tritium and at a high throughput. No one has ever done that before. Um, and it will only, um, I think we will do that at nominal levels here later this year, but this will be uh, achieved then at the ITER facility in about 15 years from now. So I think we can really be proud um, to have this as a working reality. And I'd like to show you again here the inner views of tritium laboratory, and we're really proud to have these people who really operate that for us and make sure that we have this high purity tritium source at high throughput. And how do we do that? Um, we do that by having a closed cycle, of course. We have a so-called pressure control buffer vessel where we inject a large number of tritium molecules into our source and then we pump it out. And then the important thing that most people don't see is all these technologies that are needed really to refresh the tritium to get rid of impurities and to make certain that all this is in a stable operation. And then uh, when you follow all these molecules along their way, you also may have to make sure that these uh, molecules that you are injecting here at the center of this tube are really then pumped out. And we do so in two cycles. We have an inner and an outer loop. And all this is really amazing work that has been done over the past years and decades by Tritzum Laboratory Council, and we're really proud of them. And it's really working. 
I'd like to show you one aspect here. You need to understand what are the molecules that you inject. And you need to know that for every minute over five years of measuring time, and the technology to do so has been pioneered here by many people here. I look into here. Um, and this is our laser Raman setup, which tells you uh, the number density of Fritzel molecules, of DT molecules, and of HT molecules. And this is really absolutely essential really because um, these molecules all have a different endpoint energy. And uh, <clears throat> so we need to know that. And this is an integral part of the analysis. And uh, so this is something we can really be proud of, developed over many, many years, improved uh, from a Mic 1 to a Mic 3 setup, and still being further refined. Um, now, the source um, is our WGTS beam tube. And you see we inject uh, tritium molecules at a certain rate, and this rate needs to be precise and stable at the 0.1%. We need to know the isotopic content, um, and if you look at all these challenges, we need to know the source potential on a level of about a few uh, milli electron volt or millivolt or tens of millivolt. We have a plasma, a very intense plasma, a cold plasma. No one else has this plasma, so we are really pioneering new parameters. We need to understand uh, the beam tube temperature and need to keep it constant at a 0.1% level. And of course, I told you about the active pumping that is essential really to get down in the number density of tritium molecules if we follow them along the beam line. Let me also say a few words about the stability. Again, this has all been pioneered by PhD theses uh, over many, many years. And just to get uh, you a flavor of what we can do with this pressure control buffer vessel you see here, we are recording here the pressure of this pressure control buffer vessel, which is directly used to inject tritium molecules into the source. And you see here, this is the requirement that we have here. This is the millibar in this pressure control buffer vessel. And you see the readings here for deuterium. Um, this is perfect. And this really allows us to inject a number density of molecules that is very, very stable. <clears throat> and what about the other main ingredient? This is the temperature. If you inject a certain number then of tritium molecules into your source, then you need to keep the source tube 10 meter long, 90 millimeter diameter, extremely stable in temperature. And for this, we had a specification of plus or minus 30 millikelvin per hour. And what we have measured is much, much better of 10 millikelvin over 48 hours. And you see, this is one of the technology drivers that really enable this. We have developed completely from scratch a novel beam tube cooling system, which is here based either on neon or an argon, depending on the temperature regime that you would like to work on. It's really based on this thermal siphon. And you see the outcome of this really technology development is that this temperature is really, really stable a factor of 10 better than required. And I think this is one of those main ingredients we are very, very happy about. So we have a stable source. And as I told you now, we need to reduce by 14 orders of magnitude the number density of tritium molecules. And this has never been done before, because if you would not do so, you would generate here at the spectrometer section a large background. So I think we were roaring about that. But again, here, the key message is by combining here this differential and cryogenic pumping, we really have succeeded in getting here a very small number density of tritium molecules. And just uh, one example here, this is our cryogenic pumping section. And I'd like to remind everyone to build such a cryostat takes years. In the case of the WGDS, it took 10 years for the supplier to build it. And this almost as long because here you have a large cryo trap operating at around three Kelvin. Um, you can inject argon snow with a very detailed procedure and then make sure that all the spritzer molecules that are still coming after the uh, differential pumping are still here uh, safely remaining in this cryo trap. And so we have a very large cryo trap that will, I think, in principle, be able really for a multi year campaign um, to contain these spritzer molecules. So basically, after this. Uh, uh, cryogenic pumping section, we have nothing but electrons. And the important thing is now to filter their energy. And how are we doing so? I think uh, what we have are here tritium beta decay electrons from zero up to 18.6 keV. And they are now entering here the spectrometer section. 
We have first a smaller pre-spectrometer that is operated at a fixed retarding potential. And during the campaign that will be reported about later on, that was at minus 10.4 uh, kilovolt. And the main spectrometer is an operated at a retarding potential that is variable. So what we are doing here is, uh, in principle, we form a huge panning trap. Don't do that at home. It will ignite and cause major damage. But only in case you operate those two spectrometers at a very, very good ultra-high vacuum, this panning trap will not ignite. And we are very happy um, that by operating the two spectrometers here, in a very, very stringent ultra-high vacuum regime, this panning trap does not ignite. And I think this is also one of the key features that showcases the high-tech nature of Katrin. You can really operate those two spectrometers side by side without igniting a panning trap. Let me briefly remind you that also this nice voyage that all of you, I think, know way back in 2006, uh, this also was a sort of cutting-edge logistics. I'd like to remind you again of the last meters and so again at, at this stage we were really operating here in a precision regime where we had two centimeters to the left and two centimeters to the right and uh, the importance of the ultra high vacuum is not only by not igniting panning traps but also making sure that an electron that is being transmitted here through this pre spectrometer and through the main spectrometer does not get off course because if there would be too many molecules inside of this large uh, main spectrometer, again, then an ionization process would be the cause, and then we would have a uh, much, much larger background. So I think uh, during the commissioning phase and uh, during the operation now, we are very happy that we now have, after all this major works, um, a vacuum that is equivalent to the lunar surface. It's much, much better than in low Earth orbit. And again, by making this comparison, with all due respect to our colleagues at the LHC, you see the volume of the Katrin uh, main spectrometer is larger than the LHC ring by a factor of 10. Um, and we're very happy that we are now uh, on the cover of this vacuum technology book. And um, it's the largest ever UHV recipient, and it's in operation since 2013. And it's been realized by a combination here of this very large getter pump and by uh, the um, six turbo molecular pumps that are operating and making sure that this is a long-term operation. Um, so I think we now have more than five years of operation of this main spectrometer at this ultra-high vacuum regime. And the second thing is that you would like to apply a precision high voltage, more of that later in the following talks. But here I'd like to remind you of a key ingredient. This is the inner electrode system built by Münster, and we have then in uh, common then installed it here at the inner uh, spectrometer surface. And so it's really an important ingredient, really, in a precision electromagnetic layout, because you do not just apply a high voltage to the main spectrometer, but you need a very detailed electromagnetic uh, layout to reduce the background, which is coming here from cosmic ray muons and from environmental gammas. And we do not observe a single background, either from cosmic muons or from environmental gammas. And this is the combination of the inner electrode, which works as an offset. And the second part here is this uh, magnetic field barrier that really successfully inhibits electrons generated at the surface to penetrate deeper into the flux tube. And you see here a few of our uh, earlier PhD students here, and in the back you see here uh, our large air coal system, which is compensating the earth magnetic field and allows us really to shape the size of the flux tube. And this is again very important. You hear about that later on that we have here a very versatile instrument and recently being upgraded to even further reduce background. This is what I told the R&D on Katrin, I think will never stop. So basically, uh, if I come now to the conclusion, what we have is a unique high-tech uh, instrument and it really, in almost every aspect, is much, much better than specified. And uh, everything, the main message here is everything really works together. This is, again, I think something that we can be very proud of, that all these detailed facets that I told you about are really working together, tritium technologies, cryogenics, the electromagnetic field layout, 
the particle tracking, the ultra high vacuum, the precision high voltage, the development of new electron sources and of superconducting magnets. All this works together very well. And I think this is not only here the work of KIT, but of the entire collaboration. We're very thankful for all these important, important contributions we have had. We're in total 20 institutions from seven countries and we are bundling the expertise, the technology. And I think uh, if you haven't seen it, please look at it. It's a unique high-tech instrument poised to measure the neutrino mass. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much again, um, Guido, for this fine overview on technology. Um, Catherine Valerius from KIT will now zoom in into precision electron energy measurement. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, this is both a, a great honor and also a tremendous pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, special colloquium today. I can see so many familiar faces here in the audience. I'm uh, glad you all came and I hope that you are enjoying this special event as well. So as you've heard from the previous two speakers, precision electron spectroscopy is a core feature of the Catherine experiment. It is needed in order to pursue the measurement of the tiny neutrino mass and also in order to look for those mysterious new physics signals that might be hiding in the precision beta spectra that Katrin is now recording. Okay. Let me use this 15-minute uh, presentation in order to uh, familiarize you with the requirement, what it takes in order to do precision electron spectroscopy with Katrin, and also give you an outline of the steps that we have taken in a sequence of many measurement phases in order to arrive there. As you are all aware, this feature of precision electron spectroscopy, which has now been realized, has not been achieved overnight. It has been a long journey getting there. And here you can see a time series of events that started with the completion of the Katrin beamline in late 2016, when we were able to see the first electrons from the rearmost part of Katrin transmitted right onto the focal plane detector 70 meter apart. And with this, we went into the summer 2017 a measurement campaign where we used no tritium yet, but a radioactive isotope, Krypton 83M, in order to do the first high precision electron spectroscopy with Katrin. And this led up to the first tritium campaign, which you are probably already familiar with. It was the result that we showed at the Neutrino 2018 conference last year, where we first acquired high resolution and high precision beta spectra from tritium and we were able to demonstrate and verify the system stability. And of course then after that we rolled out a, a long and very detailed systematics campaign where we used again precision electron sources in order to fully characterize our experiment which has then led up to the start of scientific harvest of Katrin with the first neutrino mass campaign that we are reporting on at this event of course about the requirements. What does it take to do precision electron spectroscopy with Katrin? And here I would like to stress again that this is a, such a core feature of Katrin that it is quite natural to me that many of our collaborating groups all across the Katrin collaboration have made really hard efforts and long-standing contributions in order to develop hardware components, deliver and operate hardware components for Katrin in order to analyze the data at the precision level that we need. So in the future slides of my talk, you will find uh, frequent references to the works of these groups and also a few publications that highlight the results when you're interested in reading those up. The first ingredient is you need a very stable and uh, very well monitored precision beta decay source, which is stable at the per mil level. And here I would like to highlight just uh, the few items that we have achieved in the course of a few measurement phases, the 
um, temperature stabilization of the source cryostat, the pressure stabilization, you've seen this already in Guido's talk, also concentration stabilization. What I cannot show here in detail is also the big efforts that go into making sure that the source conditions are stable in terms of the space charges that might be building up and that we are also certain in order to eliminate all the residual ions that might migrate through the beam line and then later on contaminate the spectrometers. All of that has to be taken care of in order to run precision electron spectroscopy. Okay, the next big requirement is, of course, the stabilization of the retardation voltage at the PPM level. And here I'd like to remind you that the Katrin main spectrometer is, of course, a huge high voltage electrode, both the vessel and also the wire grid that uh, you've already seen is mounted inside. You can see the patch panel of the wire electrode system just to show you the complexity of the high voltage equipment there. And then you need um, extensive infrastructure also to monitor this energy scale very precisely, both in the time scale that it takes to run one beta spectrum scan, so the time scale of about one or two hours, and also on the long time scale, which uh, Katrin operates on for many years in order to scan the beta spectrum. And lastly, another requirement is the uh, de um, development and operation of precision calibration sources so that you can characterize the workings of the whole experiment from the uh, gaseous source here onwards towards the spectrometer and detector section. So in this short presentation, I will not have the time to go into detail about the source um, properties, but I would like to give a, a little bit of more insights into the high voltage precision and also the development of calibration sources. Here is a very recent highlight that has been achieved. Of course, you've all seen in previous talks that the high voltage system of Katrin is actually since a long time outperforming its requirements. Um, and this has helped us a lot, of course, throughout the measurement campaigns that we are reporting on. Here I would like to just show you one very recent example from a, a time series of a few months in between only for the April 2019 measurement campaign that uh, gave us the first neutrino mass result. We already had an outstanding performance of the high voltage system, but if you look now into the recent weeks, the system has been upgraded once more and then improved again. And you can see that the time trend of a time scale of a few minutes that used to be present in the April data still is now also eliminated. So we can have even better quality of the data and uh, improve the analysis of the neutrino mass further on. What is not typically important for the analysis of neutrino mass data, but very important as a, a systematics check in order to compare with the atomic mass difference from helium-3 and uh, tritium is the absolute calibration. And here I would like to point out that uh, also through the past measurement campaigns, we've made huge improvements towards absolute calibration of the energy scale. A second um, part of my talk is um, about the precision calibration sources. Here I would like to start with a natural one. This is a nuclear and atomic standard Krypton 83M, which is widely used in uh, many experiments across neutrino physics and, uh, and dark matter search. Um, why is it so popular? Maybe some of you know the Krypton 85, which is a nasty background source in many of the uh, underground and low rate counting experiments. Here we are talking about a different Krypton isotope, which is the 83M. And you can see it is so popular because it offers many key features that are very, very handy. Short half-life, which eliminates the risk of any contamination of your apparatus on the long run. It provides a series of very narrow um, conversion electron lines, which offer also an isotropic angular distribution. So you can test the characteristics of your MIG-E filter with it, for instance. And it covers a convenient range of en line energies from very low energies, about 7 keV, up to higher energies, about 32. So what this did for Katrin is to help us with the system characterization, to test the transmission of the MIG-E filter, to check uh, detector properties, to uh, improve overall system alignment and to, of course, monitor the absolute energy scale calibration. Katrin actually makes use of this uh, very copiously. And uh, you can see that the Krypton allows us not only to distribute this uh, calibration source geometrically in many places across the beam line, but it also um, offers the opportunity to produce Krypton sources in many uh, distinctions in many forms, which then helps to also uh, cross-check results in terms of different systematics. So the first place where the Krypton is used in Katrin is actually at this parallel monitor beam line. You can see the former mine spectrometer now leading a second life as the Katrin monitor spectrometer. 
So instead of measuring the tritium beta spectrum here, you can attach an implanted Krypton 83M source and use it continuously in parallel to the uh, beta spectrum scans with the main Katrin beam line. And then you can uh, get a perfect evaluation of the energy scale, both in the course of one run and also in the course of a longer measurement period over several years. Then, of course, it is very important also to check the characteristics of the spectrometer section. Here, uh, Katrin has developed a specific source, which is mounted at the exit of the cryogenic pumping section right before the spectrometer start. And we use a thin film um, condensed on a cold substrate. So with a very thin layer, you don't suffer any scattering of the electrons going out from the source. And this is a spot-like source. You can see the image on the detector here, which can be moved over all the pixels constituting the flux tube. It gives you a good cross-check um, of the properties of the spectrometer itself. But then, of course, we have an entirely different source here. It's a gaseous form, and the krypton actually fills the whole source beam tube volume and can decay in there. It can be also mixed with inert gases, like deuterium, can be mixed with tritium inside the source. So you can also probe the plasma properties of the tritium column. Um, and this has been very helpful in uh, characterizing the source properties in the outset. You can see here the image of, of how the krypton decays actually fill the full uh, flux tube of Katrin. This is a set of uh, achievements that we have uh, made by using Krypton 83M as a tracer. You can see, for instance, on the left-hand diagram, the scan of a very narrow Krypton line is the L3 line situated at about 30 and a half kilo electron volts. You can see the sharp resolution of the integrating MACE filter and the excellent linearity of the energy scale that we have seen when connecting the dots between the different conversion electron lines that we see in the Krypton spectrum. And of course, we also did uh, reference runs with the krypton dispersed in the beam tube, both with deuterium, just to uh, check the scattering, and also with tritium um, to check whether the source plasma has any effect. On the right-hand side, you can see an image that conveys the stability of the overall system as probed by this nuclear standard krypton 83M in the course of a full week of measurement time. So what we have seen is that the st system is stable uh, from the source to the detector and that we can even perform calibration at the sub 5 ppm level based on the relative line positions that we have. A second set of calibration sources is entirely different. So this is not an isotropic source, but one that gives you better control over the starting angle, for instance. And here I would like to highlight that this is not something that you can get off the shelf. It's not a precision electron source that you can buy in electronics supply store. It's something where you have to put in a lot of development work, a lot of research, and a lot of thought to make this happen because our requirements are manifold and they are tough. So of course, for instance, you need a tunable beam energy, something around 18 kilo electron volts or less, and a very narrow energy spread on the order of 150 milli electron volts. And then of course, you also want to tune the ratio of the longitudinal energy your electrons receive and the cyclotron energy that they make because the MACE filter is very sensitive to this ratio. So you have to tune the pitch angle with which the electrons are emitted from this electron source. Then uh, your beam intensity has to be quite high in order to get good statistics on your calibration counts in the order of a few to 10 kilo counts per second. And you want to have a point size beam that you can steer all across the flux tube of the Katzen detector. And uh, for the last requirement is a very important one when you want to transform the MACE filter from an integral spectrometer into a differential time of flight spectrometer, you have to have the opportunity to pulse those electrons from the source. So how is this realized? You can see here the custom-made solution that the Katrin collaboration has uh, worked out and also a string of references that date back well, 10 years. This is the time that we have uh, taken to hone and to fine-tune this instrument. And this works by using a fiber optics to transfer UV light to a photo electron, a photo cathode. So you can uh, create a, a beam of photo electrons at very narrow energy spread. The timing is done by using a pulsed UV light source in the form of a laser. And then you have a set of electrodes. You can see here two parallel plates, for instance, um, and also um, very um, complex magnetic field set up in order to form the beam and to steer the beam where you want it to be. And the whole system is rather compact. You can see this uh, insert is uh, mounted on a 160 CF flange, but the whole environmental infrastructure of it is a source that is uh, uh, rather large by comparison. 
So here I'm proud to show you a few of the achievements that this uh, precision electron gun for Katrin has uh, made. You can see here on the x-axis the energy electrons receive uh, with respect to the filter potential of the main spectrometer. On the y-axis you see the count rate. And then you can see here a small insert that this um, the electron source has been scanned across several of the pixels of the Katrin Volker plane detector. And the small distinction that you see in the transmission curves actually reflects the properties of the Katrin McE filter, of the main spectrometer, which you see imaged onto the different pixels. Normally, of course, as you have seen in Christian's talk this morning, you would expect a step like function for the uh, monoangular source that we have developed, but what you see is a slightly smeared out step. And this is related to the underlying energy distribution of the electrons that come out of the source. On the scale of a few volts only, this looks rather large, but if you read the numbers, the width of this uh, Gaussian shape is uh, below 150 milli electron volts, so it is really a high precision electron source. And the different onset and the shift of those um, transmission curves relative to each other points you toward the small differences in the retardation potential that this electron source probes uh, through the spectrometer. Now, what is this actually being used for? Um, uh, one of the key <coughs> systematics in the neutrino mass measurement for Katrin is the effect of the column density, maybe small fluctuations of the column density, also the absolute value of it, and the energy loss that better electrons incur when they transverse this uh, gaseous tritium source. So with this electron gun mounted at the end of the source beam tube, we can test these properties very accurately by shooting 18 keV electrons from this precision beam all through the source tube and then measuring them after filtering uh, with a spectrometer on the Katrin Volker plane detector. And actually what you see in this uh, right-hand picture over here is that this precision electron guns allows to me uh, measure the response function. What do I mean by response function? The first part of this curve is only the spectrometer transmission and you can see that it's very sharp. But then as you go from an empty source tube, 0% column density to small quantities of gas in the source to larger and even larger quantities of gas in the source, you can beautifully see the effect of the electron scattering and the inelastic uh, loss of energy um, that the electrons suffer. And you can measure it very precisely with this electron gun. And uh, here you see a measurement used uh, with a deuterium gas, but it works essentially also the same with tritium in the source. And what we found is luckily our measurements of this response function agree very well with the model that has been um, calculated for the energy loss. A key ingredient in this, as I have mentioned already before, is uh, the time of flight information that you get from a pulsed precision electron source. And here you can see why this is such a beautiful idea. Um, this helps you to transform the signal from the high pass MACE filter spectrometer into a narrow band pass filter. And this of course allows you to recover from the integrated beta spectrum the full form of the differential shape. And in this uh, left hand diagram, you can see how this works. So for instance, if you put the main MACE filter on a fixed retardation voltage and you scan the beam of your precision electron source continually a little bit above this uh, retardation threshold, you can see the electrons arriving first very slowly and then uh, after shorter time of flights and you can place a cut on this so you select only electrons in a very narrow given energy range. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, what this gives you in terms of energy loss spectrum. So if you plot the amount of energy that the um, electron has lost in its scattering encounters and the frequency of those events on the y axis, you can actually see why it is important to do this measurement for the neutrino mass measurement with Katrin because uh, our measurement do not agree very well with the literature that was previously covered on this topic. So we have to do this measurement on our own with a given precision that we need. And in fact, we were successful in developing an entirely new parametrization, both for the electron scattering of deuterium last year, and now this year for the first neutrino mass run, also for the tritium related energy loss. And with this result, we uh, actually have in our hands the response function model that is ready for the neutrino mass measurements. And uh, since this is a very complicated topic, I would like to flesh this result just here very briefly before concluding. Here you can see the full beauty of the response function that was used for the neutrino mass measurements as retrieved by the calibration sources here. You can see 
both uh, on the lower panel, the energy loss function that has been uh, uh, derived from the data measured with a <coughs> precision electron gun. You can see that also multiple scattering is required in order to understand the data that we achieved. This is exactly as expected. And on the top panel, you see the response function that was measured here as a result of the multiple energy losses uh, with the uh, um, data obtained in the, in the calibration runs. And the red curve actually gives you the one response function that corresponds to the calculated response function that corresponds to the neutrino mass data that we take uh, that we've taken in the spring this year. And this is also what went into the analysis that is now um, available in the archive publication up here. Now, I hope I have convinced you that Katrin is not only made for precision electron spectroscopy, that we actually also succeed in doing that. And I'm very happy to report um, the successes of the measurement phases that we have run uh, dedicatedly to uh, convince ourselves that this is um, that, that we're on the right track there. So with the measurements that we pursued ever since the beamline was completed, we've seen that we have exactly um, the energy resolution that the MEC-E filter was designed to have. The energy scale linearity is just what we need it to be. The energy scale stability is even better than the requirements uh, actually um, were set out in the design phase of Katrin. So this is about the electron energy filter side. Now, if we move to the tritium source side, you will see that we've also seen the efficiency of the measures to retain and also to eliminate the harmful, potentially harmful ions from the beamline uh, that we have also placed uh, limits on the amount of charges that can accumulate in the source. And of course, we hope to improve on this with the next run that is supposed to start in just a few weeks from now. And we have obtained a detailed understanding of the energy loss through scattering, with, uh, which is one of the essential pre-requirements for successful neutrino mass measurement. So now that all of these requirements are fulfilled, uh, Katrin Bird is uh, finally lifting off its perch and taking flight. And I would uh, like to hand over now to Susanne Mertens, who will report about um, the measurements that we did in the spring in order to achieve our first neutrino mass result. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And we move on. And we try to remove the PDF. Could, yeah. you, could you close and open it? Will it sit there? The no, no, PDF. This sticker must work. Yeah, okay. I have a power of copy and click it, but it's And the next speaker is uh, Susanne Mertens from uh, Max Planck Institute, Munich, and Technical University, Munich, as well. And she will be reporting after, after sort of her understanding that Catherine is much about systematics. Um, we are not in a position to be introduced to our first measurement campaign and uh, the first physics, real physics data run. Okay, so I think we are trying to fix the PDF uh, sign on top. Let's see. In the meanwhile, so uh, welcome everybody. It's really great to see all the uh, faces from when I did my PhD here in 2008 to 12. And it's a real honor to present to you the uh, 2009 Neutrino Mass Campaign. If we can see the slides. <laughs> huh. <laughs> yes, so. But I think we are very well in time, so I'm sure uh, we didn't think that we were so precise in the timing, so we still have some more. <laughs> Start to explore and one more to explore to the next Das The problem is that the task nicht mehr in den Vordergrund geht. Seitdem Akrobat auf Vollbild ist, liegt Akrobat im Vollbild mit einem schwarzen Bildschirm. Und wir sind im Sperrbildschirm. Ähm, wir bräuchten das Passwort tatsächlich einmal. <lacht> Großartig.
Ähm, könnten wir das Passwort nochmal haben? Okay, I think we made it. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Um, Okay, it's a pleasure and an honor to present to you the um, 2019 Catherine Neutrino Mass campaign. And what is that? It is indeed the first ever high activity tritium operation of the Catherine experiment. And it took place in spring this year from April 10 to May 13. And this accounts for about a month worth of data. And within these four weeks, we collected a total amount of 2 million electrons, and this is really a high quality data set. And this data set allowed us to produce the first neutrino mass result of Catherine, which is now the world leading result in the field of direct neutrino mass measurements. So in this talk, my goal is to give you some kind of feeling of what it takes to obtain this high quality data with the Catherine apparatus. And I think that many of the old students, you're quite aware of what it takes. But for you, it may be nice to, to see how maybe your project became reality now for this neutrino mass measurement. So as a very quick reminder, the very basic idea of Catherine is to combine a high luminosity tritium source with a high resolution spectrometer. So we obtain the so-called integral beta spectrum by counting how many electrons overcome the electrostatic filter as a function of the filter voltage. So now you may think, okay, that, that sounds completely trivial. We can all count to two million and where is the difficulty here? And the difficulty, the challenge of this measurement is really that the neutrino mass signal is such a small distortion in the shape of the tritium spectrum, very close to the endpoint such that we need to have ultra-stable operation of all the parameters and an ultra-precise understanding of our whole instrument, such that we don't get any distortion in the spectrum that we may confuse with the signal of the neutrino mass. So you will see that uh, this first neutrino mass campaign was not only about counting electrons, but it's really about monitoring and calibration um, all the time throughout the measurement campaign. So um, the key parameters that need to be monitored and calibrated, I think this was mentioned in the previous talks, are temperature, concentration, pressure, the magnetic fields in the system, and the high voltage. So let's have a look first at uh, the source section here. During the uh, first neutrino mass campaign, tritium gas was circulated in the tritium loop and we obtain a gas density of 20% of the nominal gas density. Why not 100%? This is due to the so-called burn-in phase. You have to imagine that for the very first time, the instrument was exposed to high radioactivity tritium gas. And this means that there are some radiochemical interaction with the walls that limit this gas density. And we expect this to be... Um, much less limited in the me next measurement campaign. The tritium gas that was circulated here was a very high tritium purity, 97.5% tritium. And with these two, num two numbers, we obtain an activity of 2.5 times 10 to the 10 becquerel. And this is about 25 giga becquerel of tritium. So it's really a high activity. This is equivalent to um, a throughput of 4.9 gram of tritium per day through the tritium loop system. And of course, such an endeavor is only possible if you have the dedicated facility to do that. And this is here the unique uh, tritium laboratory of the KIT, which is the reason why the Catherine experiment is, was actually built uh, at KIT. But uh, the source is not only circulating the tritium, but as I said, we have to monitor all its properties all the time. So it's all about monitoring. And what do we need to monitor? We need to know the gas density, the source density, the source composition, the source activity in each moment. And we need to know the source potential. 
What does this mean? So let's have a look at this source potential. In fact, the tritium that we have in our source is not just neutral gas, but we have a lot of positive ions, also negative ions, and a lot of uh, low energy electrons, so charged particles. And together with the magnetic field, this creates a plasma. Now, such a plasma can exhibit a plasma potential, an electric potential. And we really need to control this potential. And to do that, we use the gold-plated rear wall, which is here at the very rear end of the beam line. And prior to the measurement, we spent quite some time in optimizing the potential of this rear wall. And our goal was to optimize both the coupling of the plasma to the rear wall and also to obtain a homogeneous plasma potential throughout the source. Okay, after that was settled, we could go ahead with our measurements. And then we wanted to know what is exactly the gas density that we have in each moment in our source. And for that, as it was shown by catching, we used our electron gun that is shooting electrons through the source. So you can imagine if you have a high energy beam of monoenergetic electrons traversing through the source, depending on the source density, they will scatter and lose energy. So we can check how many percent of the electrons make it all the way through the experiment as a function of their energy. And that gives us a measure of how much gas density we have in our source. So with this measurement that was repeated regularly about 10 times throughout the four weeks, we could determine the gas density to be of this value with a precision better than 1%. Next, we also want to know what is our source actually composed of. And for that, we have a dedicated laser Raman system. And you can see here that we do not only have T2, but there may be some DT, some HT, and also some neutral isotopologues. And all of them are circulated in the loop through a so-called laser Raman cell. And here we shine laser light onto the molecule, excite rotational or vibrational excitation, and thereby shift the wavelength of the laser light. And by the shift of this wavelength, we can determine which type of gas is in our source. So with that method, we could establish a high purity of tritium, which is 97.5%, and also a very high stability of our concentration. Finally, we want to know the activity of the source in each moment. And for that, we have two dedicated extra instruments, one at the back of the apparatus and one in the front. And this is the so-called big system. Um, it measures X-rays that are produced when the electrons are hitting this gold rear wall. By measuring the rate of these X-rays, we can determine the rate, uh, the decay rate. And here in the front, we have the so-called forward beam monitor that is made of two silicon detectors that constantly measures the rate of electron hitting this detector. So based on all these uh, systems, we could establish a source stability on the order of 2%, which meets the requirements for this first science run, but we expect this to be improved in the future. Coming back to the big picture, now we have uh, talked about the source and its monitoring. Let's have a look at the spectrometer section. So what is the role of the spectrometer section? Essentially, it's very easy. So the idea is to count the number of electrons that make it through the spectrometer as a function of the retarding potential, which we can set to an arbitrary value. But the question here is, at which retarding do we want to measure? And how long do we want to measure at each retarding potential? So this has to be decided and um, optimized for our science goals. So um, the information about how to do that is encoded in the so-called measurement time distribution. And this is what you see here. It shows you how long do we have to measure at a given retarding energy or retarding potential. So why did we choose this peculiar 
um, shape here, it becomes more cle clear when we overlay that with the actual spectrum. So you see here that we have chosen an energy range of uh, 40 electron volt below the endpoint, so uh, measuring really the beta decay spectrum, and 50 electron volt above the endpoint, where we see no beta electrons, but just the background. Altogether, we are measuring at 27 high voltage set points and setting them once each takes about two hours. So altogether, we have repeated the setting of all the 27 high voltages 274 times. And each time we obtain a whole tritium spectrum. Okay. So now you may ask, why do you measure so much time above the endpoint where you don't even see any beta electrons? And the reason for that is that we need to understand our background. So we know what our background is composed of. We have a radon decays and uh, excited hydrogen decays inside the volume of our large main spectrometer, and they can create background. But what we need to know is the precise distribution of background rate. And for that, we spent about 20% of our measurement time above the endpoint. And also we need to exclude that there is any retarding potential dependence of our background, which is not expected, but needs the experimental proof. Of course, we also need to set the high voltages very precisely. And I think this was emphasized in previous talks. So we have two instruments to verify the high voltage stability. There is uh, the monitoring spectrometer that is electrically connected to the main spectrometer and our high precision high voltage divider. And with both devices, we could verify the both short term and long term high voltage stability, which exceeds our um, specifications. Finally, we need to count the electrons and this is happening here at the exit of the main spectrometer where we have a 148 pixel detector installed. And uh, during the first neutrino mass campaign, 80% of all the pixels were used. We could establish that this detector has a very high detection efficiency. And what is even more important, um, this detector shows no strong retarding potential dependence of its detection efficiency. And this is crucial for the neutrino mass measurement. Keep in mind that uh, each of these pixels measures a statistically independent spectrum. So we obtain one beta decay spectrum for each of the detector pixels. Okay, now you may think it's over, but it's not, because what comes out here is raw data, something that a human being cannot really deal with. And this is not only true for the focal plane detector, but for all the other systems too. So the forward beam monitor, the laser Raman system, the big system and others, they all deliver some raw data. All of this needs to be processed, needs to be made accessible through the Katrin databases. Then we perform a long list of data quality checks before finally we come up with a high level data file that you can look at and that you can plot and do your analysis. How does this look like? It contains the holy grail, the tritium spectrum. Here it is. So you have the count rate as a function of the retarding potential, but we won't only have one of them, but more than 30,000. Why is that? You remember, we get one tritium spectrum for each pixel and one for each scan. So altogether, we will have 30,000 beta decay spectra. And then comes the task of the analysis team. The we call this fitting team. And the fitting team has to think of a smart way to combine these spectra, to use them to infer the physics parameter, the neutrino mass, the thing that we are interested in, and to make an estimation of the uncertainties. And this is then the content of the next talk. But I would like to uh, complete my talk by really reminding you that all of this is based on a large number of people 
that have worked on the experiment over many years. And you see maybe your, the fruit of your work uh, appearing here in my talk. But also the people that were present during the data taking. So we had students and senior scientists from all over the world really coming to KIT, taking the shifts, being there and uh, conducting their, uh, their contribution to the measurement. So, yeah, it, I, I want to emphasize that it was a highly motivated team of shifters, but also technical staff and the data analysis, analysis and yeah, it was a, a strong connection. And um, yeah, there are many people to mention, many, many names, but uh, me personally, I would like to thank Magnus Schlösser, who really did a fantastic job in coordinating this data-taking period and made it a pleasurable experience for all the participants. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much again, Susanna. Now, I think you've prepared us wonderfully for the great finale, which is given by Thierry Lazer from CRL Saclay and uh, also Technical University of Munich. And uh, all speakers took great care not to mention one number. And I think you will break this tradition and give us the, the number we are waiting for now. Maybe. So, <laughs> maybe. So that's great. So. So, wow, so I'm uh, the last. So I would like to thank you, uh, Guido and Christian. So it's really for me a great pleasure and uh, an honor to, to be here at KIT to uh, uh, present the, the first uh, uh, Catherine result and the data analysis. And, uh, okay. I have, I think there is a subliminal uh, image. Okay then it's good to know. So I come back to the, the signal. So you see the tritium spectrum, you see the tail of the tritium spectrum, the so-called endpoint, and we have to search for a very small distortion in the tail of the spectrum as an imprint of the neutrino mass. It's a very small effect, less than 1%, and it's an absolute measurement. So we have to compare it with uh, the theory. Absolute measurement means difficult and means that we have to keep uh, the control of all the parameters that we have heard about in the previous talks. Then somehow all of this has to enter into the final analysis. So uh, our observable is the integral beta spectrum that was uh, presented. And we have to model that uh, for the analysis. And this comes from first the modelization of the tritium beta decay. This is the theory. And this contains the information of uh, the neutrino mass plus many small uh, corrections that are very well under control. And to have this integral spectrum, it has to be combined with the experimental setup response function. And this contains all the information that we have heard about in the previous talks. And both of these information has to be controlled at the level of a few per mil and for a period of, now it was four weeks, but it will be for five years. And like that, we get the integral beta spectrum. And of course, we have to add the fact that here we see the, the tritium, and here we have the backgrounds, and backgrounds have to be taken into account, and they have to be understood even below uh, the endpoint where we have also the tritium signal. I would like also to tell that the analysis, it is, is the work of many, many, many people, more than half of the collaboration, certainly, and it has also to be organized as a project, like when you build the, the spectrometer or when you build the source. And in this case, so we divided the analysis in two parts, a common trunk part that where this is analysis work, but it concerns modeling or calibration. You can check, you can check against the model. You have data to check against some calibration device. And this is the common trunk. 
And then there is another part that concerns the final fit that gathers all the information to extract the neutrino mass measurement. And unfortunately there, we have no calibration device. And so in order to be robust, we had to design it such that we perform this final fit using two different independent and complementary approaches. So you see that we have many working groups in there and each working group has a task leader that is probably in the room and we have then task and work packages and for each work packages we needed to have one person in charge, one person responsible and it means that many young people, PhD students, sometimes postdocs or even master students took a responsibility and we needed all of that, each of these parts, to be able to uh, perform this analysis. And this analysis that, uh, oops, has a schedule, so something is not working well, but it doesn't matter. So we needed all these ingredients, one after the other, in order to conduct this analysis that started long time ago, we got the data and at the end of uh, uh, May, and we presented the results, and Guido was presenting the result last week, exactly four months after the end uh, of the data attack. Okay, so as Suzanne was explaining, when we took the data, we had beta scans, 274 of them, and uh, this is a first glance at the data. This is, these are the data for a single uh, beta scan. You can see the tritium spectrum as a function of the retarding energy. Somewhere here, we have the endpoint. Here, we have the background region. And here, we see the tritium signal rising as we go far away from the endpoint. In this case, we have no sensitivity to the neutrino mass because it's only two hours of data. And we can perform a first fit with all this modelization that I was presenting. And we obtain with statistical error bars only, here we had to even enlarge the error bars, a very nice fit to uh, the model with measuring uh, the endpoint with a precision of 0.5, uh, 0.25 electron volt, measuring also very well the background. And the first task that we did is to check for the stability of this measurement as a function of the data taking time. And the data taking time Overall, it lasted for 780 uh, hours, so a little bit like, uh, to say, uh, similar to one month. And you can see here the stability plot for the background as a function of time and for the fitting, the uh, measurement for each beta scan of the endpoint. Everything behaved very well statistically, so we can say that at this stage, we already knew that we have already great data. So the instrument is working very well. And uh, so you can see that there are some uh, slight fluctuations here. That is the so-called non-Poissonian background that leads to a, a, a slight systematics that we, uh, based on this data, it's a few percent effect had to include into the analysis. So the analysis strategy, uh, is the following. So uh, with respect to the history of all the measurement in the field of direct kinematic uh, neutrino mass uh, determination, we designed a bias-free analysis strategy in order not to influence ourselves based on the data that we look at. So we wanted to have something that is really an analysis that is really bias-free. And for that, we uh, first made something for each of these beta scans that you could uh, see you could, uh, earlier, we design a twin beta scan based on Monte Carlo data only. And we implemented and freezed all the analysis cut and uh, based on this Monte Carlo data set for this uh, science run. So we were not influenced by the neutrino mass and we could mimic very well uh, what we observed with Monte Carlo data. So then we had also, we have implemented a model blinding. So in order, when we were at the very last stage of the analysis, not to be also influenced by the data, we changed a little bit the molecular physics uh, modeling. Oops, uh, 
Yeah, we changed the nuclear physics modeling such that we could, oops, we could uh, not infer the uh, neutrino mass parameter, but we could study all the other parameters uh, uh, based on the actual data. And uh, the last thing is the independence and complementarity in order also to make sure that there was no bug somehow in our analysis, we implemented in the final fit two different independent approaches. The first one based on the covariance matrix method and the second one based on the so-called Monte Carlo propagation. method. And we performed the full analysis with these two uh, uh, analysis approaches. So this is uh, now an example. It shows the fake data, fake data spectrum here, the tritium data, and then you can see the background. And here the error bars are included. We have a large statistics. It's about two millions of events. And in order to get this spectrum, we have to combine all the beta scans. This is what we call the stacking, the plot you have seen earlier. And for this first analysis, we don't have to use with the statistics that we have the information from all the pixels independently. So we gathered all the pixels into a single big pixel as uh, the detector. And like that, we could just perform the final an analysis by uh, fitting one uh, spectrum. We have here the error bars included. We have here a zoom on the endpoint region. And we in increased the error bar by a factor of 50, such that you can see the error bar. So, the statistics is very high, and you can see that the data here are not yet the data. The Monte Carlo, of course, it looks uh, very nice too, and we have to compare that later to uh, the uh, actual data, but all the analysis was prepared based on this fake data set. So then we had to think of the systematics. So this, is, this was the first time that we did this analysis and we could have had some surprise, something in the data that looks a little bit weird. So we had to scrutinize all the possible instrumental effects that we have seen earlier in order to check their impact uh, for the neutrino mass measurement. So we have, for example, slight fluctuations of the activity within a single beta scan, but this is being monitored by uh, all the systems that we have uh, seen earlier. We had to uh, model the response functions and account for slight evolution of uh, the magnetic field with respect to what we know, or with the inelastic scattering energy loss, or with some scattering parameters. And this is also included in the analysis. We have molecular physics calculation, and they lead to very, very, very little systematics uh, in our data sets. We have uh, now stacked all the beta scans and by doing stacks, we do some kind of averaging. And it turns out that this is also negligible for this analysis. We have uh, possibly very slight uncertainty due to the theoretical corrections. This is also negligible. And it turned out that for this analysis, the most important systematics were related to the background, the non-Poissonian fluctuations of the background, and uh, a possible uh, background slope. And these systematics are maybe not there, especially for the slope, but with the statistics that we had, we could only give a given constraints on uh, this possible deviation to the flatness. So for Guido, I have the, the German version of this background. And now this is our expectation. So based on the Monte Carlo, before doing the analysis, we could compute what are we going to measure if the actual neutrino mass squared, that is the parameter that we do really measure in Catherine, is zero. And so uh, we expect something that is uh, at one sigma with uh, uncertainty between minus one and plus one. And at 95% of uh, probability, we expected a value for the neutrino mass squared in between minus two to plus two EV squared. And we would have been happy with any of these results, 
even slightly different would have been better. It would have been a 5% chance if uh, uh, the parameter would be even a little bit further away. And now let's uh, have a look at the data. So these are the real data. You cannot see by eye any difference with respect to the Monte Carlo. And these are very high quality data. And I think that this is something, that this is certainly the most important to take away message uh, from this uh, presentation that the instrument is working extremely well. So we have uh, here uh, in this range about uh, 20, uh, 520 hours of uh, beta scan. We have 1.5 million of electrons coming from the tritium and about uh, 0.5 million of electrons coming from uh, the background. And here, it, it, we took all this background data in order to well constrain the flatness of the background when we go a little bit below the endpoint where we start to see the tritium signal appearing. So this is on purpose that we took all this uh, uh, background. And here you can see a zoom. And now we have to adjust and compare this data to the model, including the neutrino mass to get uh, the final result. And this is what we call the final fit. And you can uh, see it there. Unfortunately, there is a slight PowerPoint <laughs> problem that affects the, the, the results. But <laughs> I, will I, will tell you, uh, I will tell you anyway. So this is the spectrum that you just saw uh, before. This is here the measurement time distribution. So we expect some slight distortion due to the neutrino mass squared in this region. This is the fit that pass exactly well through the data point. And one can, if we want to see the error bar, one has to enlarge this error bar by a factor of 50. So these are 50 sigma so-called error bars. You can see the residual, the goodness of the fit is excellent. The chi-square that we find is excellent. So we can perfectly model our data and obtain a best fit that is m square equal minus one plus or minus one electron volt square. So, and in this case, the uncertainties are completely dominated by the statistical fluctuations. So we are not yet and far away from the systematic work. So uh, we have this minus one plus minus one electron volt square. So we can perform according to the two approaches that we designed Monte Carlo simulations to compute what is the probability to have such a fluctuations. And it turns out that it is something like 15% uh, and it corresponds to one sigma fluctuation. So this was absolutely expected according to statistics. Now coming back to the systematics. Systematics, they are there. We start to see some of them. And we had here the systematics that were uh, scrutinized uh, and uh, uh, found independently with the two approaches, the Monte Carlo propagation and the covariance matrix. The amount of systematics on M square is 0.3 electron volt square. So you can see the total error is one EV square. The statistical error is 0.97 EV square and the systematics is 0.3 EV square. So it is there, but completely negligible uh, for this analysis. And the dominant systematics are coming from this non-Poissonian component of the background and the uh, background slope. The background slope is not really systematic. It is just that we don't have enough statistics to constrain the background to be perfectly flat. And so this will be reduced with two things, more statistics and lower background. And these things, we are already have that at end in Catherine in the next run that is going to start very soon. And we will be led then with the uh, here subdominant systematics. So this is the final result. 
You can see here the physical parameter m square value that we measure as a function of the time. The two previous best results were given by the Troit and Mainz uh, collaborations. This is here the world average, this blue band. And this is this first uh, Catherine result that improves with respect to the previous measurement in terms of errors by a factor of three. I would like to remind you that here we have the st statistical uncertainty as a function of the time. And we, can, uh, we have also all the experiments. And here we have two regions, the experiments that were had errors that were above one electron volt. And now we enter with Catherine in the precision measurements because you can see that for the first time, the statistical error is below one electron volt. And you can see that the previous results, mine and Troitsk, they were using several years of uh, uh, measurement times. In the case of Catherine here, we had a source running at uh, one uh, force of its intensity. So the measurement that we are presenting today is equivalent to five days of Catherine at a nominal intensity. And with already five days, this supersedes by a factor of two multi-year measurement campaigns. And here, we have to thank the people from Catherine and especially the people from KIT and the TLK, because this is possible because we have such a beautiful and powerful, stable uh, tritium source. And you can see that soon in the future, the progress will increase very fast in terms of statistics. And we expect here a statistical error that will be really extremely small after five years of data tech. For the systematics, we have also the same progress, there was some here uh, stagnation, and with this first science run, we reduced the systematics already by a factor of six. And once we will get you read of this uh, background systematics, then using the state-of-the-art instrument, then we will have already at hand, based on the data we have, this factor 10 that uh, is needed for the final sensitivity of 200 milli electron. So now we have this parameter M square. M square is a little bit technical. What people want to know is what is the upper limit on the neutrino mass. And for that, so we choose to uh, use a conservative approach and we could set an upper limit on the neutrino mass of 1.1 electron volt at 90% confidence level. And this is the new world best limit uh, for this uh, parameter for what concerns direct measurement of uh, uh, MU. So now, last uh, parameter that has been addressed is that when we measure the neutrino mass squared, we have also in Catherine a measurement of the endpoint. And you can see here, you can see here the final measurement and the expected distributions for the neutrino mass squared and this value of E0 that you uh, have here. E0 is so somehow the maximum electron energy that uh, the, the electron can get in the tritium beta decay. And this is not the final physics parameter that we can compare with other measurement. The physics parameter is the Q value that is somehow the difference of mass of the uh, uh, mother and daughter uh, atoms to some extent. And we could compare this value with, with the expectation. And this is uh, in perfect agreement. So this gives also the full consistency uh, for this measurement of the neutrino mass squared and the endpoint that are, as you can see, fully uh, correlated or almost fully correlated. So I would like now to come to the uh, conclusions. So this is the first uh, science run, seven 
780 hours of data collected with an intensity of 25 uh, gigabecquerel in the source, equivalent to five days of nominal Catherine. So there was this uh, uh, sentence by Rutherford that uh, if you need a statistician to uh, analyze the results of your experiment, then do another one. And this is exactly the case. Here, we don't need a statistician. The data are very nice. And the takeaway message is that we have a really an uh, extremely powerful instrument at hand. This is the state of the art. And this is why then we can perform also, we can show you this very nice data and with very small uh, systematics at the moment. So this is the, uh, currently the world best direct neutrino mass measurement. And somewhere there was the value here. 1.1 uh, electron volt is the upper limit at 90% confidence level. With respect to uh, precedent uh, experiments, the, systematic, the statistics is improved by a factor of two. The systematics uncertainty have already been uh, reduced by a factor of uh, six. And here you can see uh, the results that were uh, appearing this morning uh, and that have been submitted for publication. And what you can't see here is the target goal of uh, Catherine 200 mi electron volt within the next five years. And uh, as a conclusion, I would like to thank all the collaboration, but especially here in this talk, all the people, the young people that contributed to this uh, analysis. This is probably more than half of the collaboration. And this would not have been possible without you. And I would like to thank you also for your attention. So. Well, thank you very much, uh, Thierry, for a wonderful talk, uh, wrapping up uh, the series of talks and uh, with, the, with the, of course, the number, many numbers, of course, but also the number. Now, um, I think, I hope we have managed to share our excitement about, uh, about this, this last run and, uh, and um, the, uh, well, preliminary conclusion of uh, um, almost two decades of work um, with you. And uh, on this uh, positive uh, note, I would like to like us to, to thank all the speakers again. <laughs> now, this, this event is not exactly over yet. There will be uh, um, um, the opportunity for um, finger food and, uh, and um, the opportunity to socialize. But uh, also in uh, room 116, the opportunity for more extended questions, also from the press. Thank you very much. So the food is uh, served upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>